try and record. <laughs> So, since all the points are going to be there, Holy Spirit, how are we? Um, 
I want to say thank you to everyone who has taken us to eat. Can't you tell I've been eating nonstop <laughs> since I've been here? <laughs> thank you for inviting us into your homes and spending time with us. We so appreciate that. You know, uh, you're the only people we go and see Hallelujah. that take that much time for us. Mm -hmm. Everybody else, I just want you to preach, and I want you to do this and that. Just We just want to suck you dry, and then we'll sit you home. <laughs> <laughs> but you all have so refreshed us, and we have enjoyed being with each one of you, all the different families within the family of Jim here and you know, Um So we appreciate that, okay? So what I'm going to say out of you today is purely out of love. I'm not angry with anyone. All right? <laughs> Verse 11. Uh, uh, let's go to verse 7. Jump up to verse 7. And then we'll drop down to verse 11. Okay? It says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So then Christ disperses gifts to his body. Okay? Let's see what those gifts are. Verse 11. And he gave some, so in context, the gifts of Christ, he gave some apostles and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. So, again, these are gifts. These are not idols. Amen. Amen. Yeah. They are gifts, not idols. Can you hear that? Yes. They, they are to be treated precious, but not as if they are God Almighty Himself. Amen. Amen. All right. Because, see, too much focus is given on people. Instead of the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Instead of the one they should be testifying of. And we honor great men and women who have gone there with the Lord, but we want the Lord. Yeah. Amen? Amen. All right. Amen? And why did he give them? That's also important. <laughs> why did he give those gifts to his body? It says, for the perfecting of the saints. For the maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, this should cause questions within us. If someone is called to this ministry of where we are sharing with the body the work of the Lord, there should be uh, maturity happening within the body. There should be uh, equipping for the work of the ministry. There should be the building up of the body, right? And when we don't see that, then we have issues. And here's where the Lord takes issue, and I've had encounters with him, when he has taken issue with me over what I was preaching and how it was not affecting the body in edification. And so when we come to learn Christ, firstly, we must come to him. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but he gave them for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. To what end? Not, not just, okay, we're going to build you up. But to what end? See, we have to understand the full picture, right? And it says here, verse 13, until we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or mature man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Here's something that Paul is contending for that most preachers fight against. To come to the full measure of the stature of Christ. And, and, and what we hear is, well, we can never truly be like him. So we have preachers discouraging the students to actually become like the teacher. Or to come up to the level of the teacher. Which is what the Lord wants. And the only way that can be done is if the individual sent to preach has him themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and not just the ability to hook scriptures together. Mm -hmm. Understanding the full counsel of God. Yes. This is our responsibility. Yes. Yes. And I'm speaking to all of us as a whole because that's what the Lord wants to do in you. To use you to bring many others to him. Amen. And not just say, oh, we, we evangelized them and, and so many uh, got saved. So many renewed their dedication to Christ. That is not the point. Mm -hmm. 
to the full measure of Christ. Yes. Amen. 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 Y'all still here? Yeah. <laughs> to what end? That we henceforth, look at verse 14, be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. In other words, this is what we see going on in the body of Christ right now. It's so prevalent. Every new revelation gets a full following of people. Yeah. <laughs> All they have to say is, you know, I received this in a vision, or this, this is what happened to me, and here's my experience. And they say that, and so many flock to those experiences. And he says, if we would learn Christ, if we would come to him, those new waves of revelation wouldn't throw us off focus. We would be able to see them and say, okay, that's not really the Lord. Or that's not really what he meant. The Lord wants us to grow up. To mature in the fullness of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Do y'all still want it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, the measure of Christ in every individual. So in this body, every individual would contribute to the whole body if that individual would grow in Christ. Yes. So he comes straight down to the heart, straight down to the individual. He goes on. <clears throat> makes and makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This is this is why you don't need can I, I want to help us out for a second. Because what we, what we have in the body of Christ, and I don't want to down anybody for any decisions that they've had to make, but I just want to show us how far we've fallen from God's original purpose here. We say something like, you know what, there are a lot of people within the body of Christ who are depressed. There are a lot of people who are in the church who have a lot of mental issues, and so they need Jesus and they need counseling. We need this, and we need that. Mm -hmm. When the scriptures are clear, the body would edify itself if we would learn Him. Mm -hmm. In other words, the issues that you are facing inside, whether mental or physical or in the heart, would be taken care of if we would allow the Lord to increase in us. <laughs> Because now we chase after sensual wisdom of the ages. For example, you know, I would, when I was in college, uh, I used to get kicked out of uh, the classroom by the professors because they try so very hard to uh, disrupt my faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And they try to do it with so-called science and philosophy. And when I would challenge them, <laughs> they would get upset and throw me out of the class and say <laughs> I was being disruptive to the atmosphere of learning. Mm -hmm. So they would tell me things like, well, you know, we all came from monkeys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so, it, Slater, isn't it possible, though? They, they would challenge you. They, I wouldn't say anything. Just teach me what you want me to know so I can pass your class as I just sit there. And then, without fail, every time, the teacher would go through the roster. roster Slater, what do you think about this? <laughs> and I would tell him, you don't want to know what I think. Just tell me what you want me to know. <laughs> and no, 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 no. We want you, why don't you come up here and explain your ideas to the class? <laughs> and I would say, Professor, please. Can you just tell me what you want me to know? You're not going to like what I have to say. 
If you want me to say the earth is billions of years old on the test, I will put that on the test. He said, no, I want you to come up. So I would come up, and I would say the professor was wrong. <laughs> Christ is not a monkey. And then they would challenge me. But, but Slater, isn't it possible that God used elevation uh, or, or evolution to, to create us all? I say, no. And by your own definition of science, that's not true. And I will go through it, and then they kick me up. <laughs> and I will remind them, you invited me up here. Yes, <laughs> because Christ was the focus. And so Christ would make us to understand. You know, there were certain things that the Lord taught me about nature. I've, I've seen um, the planet Saturn up close. And he let me see the rings around uh, that planet, what they were made of. I was like, oh. Okay, and so then when the professors began to describe what it was, I would tell them if they were right or wrong. Because Christ has showed me. Right? And he did these things to make me unshakable. Unshakable in the knowledge of who he is. Right? And so then, conventional wisdom. I want to say this to all of our college age or university age uh, peoples here. You know, just because they have the whole alphabet after their name doesn't mean they know anything. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Just because you have MD, PhD, BA, BS, ABC, <laughs> yes. Bachelor of Science. BSC. 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 I would tell them, you know what, and I'll explain to the class, it's not that, they, that I know more than them. That's not the issue. It's just that I'm right and they're wrong. <laughs> yeah. They can know volumes of books. They can have the whole Britannica memorized. It doesn't matter. If we don't know Christ, Amen. it means nothing. Amen. It comes Amen. to nothing. Amen. So... The Lord took me, or is taking me, on this journey of learning Him. Mm -hmm. yes. And learning exactly what He wants me to know. And that is Himself. Amen. He is the increase. Right. So then, my job, when I come and I speak, I'm just either planting or watering. But who gives the increase? God gives the increase. Amen. So I should not be lifted up. It is Christ who's glorified. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes? Yes. yes? So then, now that we got that situated, now let's look at this. Let's go back to Joshua chapter 1, which was just quoted earlier. This book of the law shall not depart from, your, from out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. The Lord already lays out the blueprint for us. He says, if you take my words and continue to take them in day and night, isn't this... The same thing the Lord Jesus said, we talked about this in the conference, that to abide in Him is to allow His words to remain in you. Yes. And the only way they don't slip is that they keep going in. They keep going in over and over and over and over. To meditate, you know the word meditate here, it, it, it really means to, uh, to mutter, to chew over and over and over again. And we see the picture of the cow, right? who has four stomachs, they chew, and they chew, and they chew, and they swallow, spit it up, chew, and chew, and chew, and chew, and swallow, spit it up, chew, and chew, and chew, and chew, and swallow, spit it up, 
chew and chew and chew until it is fully digested. Right? And this is how the Lord desires us to be, that we would focus ourselves with learning everything that He said. And you know what that does when we learn everything that He said? I'll tell you the first thing it did for me. It removed the intimidation that I would get something wrong. Does that make sense? You know, if you go back to um, all of uh, my old teachings from when I first started, back when I was 18 and my early 20s, what you will see is that I had a very hard time preaching anything out of the Old Testament because I was so afraid. I was like, oh, I don't get it. I don't understand. So I just won't go there. So everything I preached was straight out of the New Testament. And, and what that led me to was private interpretation, just what I thought made sense. But when I set myself to learn, to continue to chew on the Word, to continue to eat, to read, to, to strive for understanding, that's when things became clear, that I could see the person that the Scriptures testified of. Right? All of these Scriptures, Old and New, Testi uh, Old and New Testament, testify of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Every single one of them. Amen. So then when you hear someone preaching, then we will be able to discern. Where are they pointing us to? What is the goal of their preaching? Where are they trying to bring me? And if I don't see the person, Jesus Christ, it is worthless. Every single time. No matter how true it sounds, no matter how true it may even be. And here's what I mean by that, by principle. You know, if you plant a seed in the ground and you water it, it's going to grow. Yeah. You know that's true. Yeah. But if it's not to bring me to Christ, what they're saying is worthless. <laughs> this is what's going to help us. You know, I, I respect a great many of people. Um, there's so many prophets and apostles, true apostles that I, I look at and I say, man, I really respect them. But then, I wasn't afraid to disagree with them mm. when the subject of what they preached was other than the person of Jesus Christ. Mm. I say, ah, something's wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't so I could talk about them, yeah. but so I could pay attention to the Lord. Amen. Say, oh, okay, Jesus. Oh, I see you now. That wasn't you. So when the Holy Spirit is involved, <laughs> let's help us out. When Jesus said, uh, when the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit would come, mm -hmm. He wouldn't speak of Himself. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't speak of you. Mm -hmm. He would speak of Christ. Mm -hmm. He would unveil the person of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, if someone is claiming that the Holy Spirit spoke to them, and yet Christ was not revealed, I don't care how passionate they are, it wasn't Him. Can we see that? Yes. These are those sobering moments. You know, after, because I'm, I'm going to show you right in the Scriptures, and, and He quoted it right out of uh, Matthew chapter 4, and Luke chapter 4, of, of Christ's temptation in the wilderness of what happens when the Word is sown, like when, when, when the Lord speaks to us, when he's, he's endeavoring to teach us of His Son, so that we come into the fullness of what's actually going to happen afterwards. Because, see, everyone is excited, and, and everyone says, you know what, uh, things are making sense now, things are clicking now, like, I'm, I'm so excited, I'm so glad that, that uh, Brother Slater said this or said that, and, and I, I can hear it now. This is all exciting. And then we have to see what happens after all the excitement is gone. Because the Lord doesn't want us to live based on excitement. Our life is the life of Christ. Not emotionalism. We can be excited. There's nothing wrong with being excited. But we have to be able to discern that excitement doesn't actually mean growth. Right? Remember, we talked about this during the conference. 
it was, you know what? People are going to, uh, they're going to be excited, you know, but the excitement will leave. But it's what you do when the excitement is gone that really counts. Because the Lord has to test us. You know, we make these commitments. You know, every commitment you've ever made to the Lord, He has never forgotten, even though you may have. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, me. <laughs> he holds us to it. We must be tested. To see if what we're vowing to the Lord really holds up to the test of time. Is our yes still yes? Yeah. Or is it only <clears throat> when I feel good, when it sounds good, when I'm happy? <laughs> so you'll never be happy until you come into Christ. Yeah. Never. You'll only go through emotional highs and lows. you go like this your whole life. You'll be unstable. Because Christ is not the foundation. Christ is not the all in all. His word isn't filling us. Uh, Pastor Lee and I were talking about it this morning. Um, and let's, let's go to Matthew chapter 3 while we're at it. Pastor Lee was... Um, we, we were talking this morning, it's like, you know what, we can, we can say something sometimes, and, and everyone's like, oh man, you know, it's like, that was so good. It's like I've never heard before. And I'm like, I just said that last week. <laughs> when are we going to move on? <laughs> when are we going to take learning serious? You know, let's throw it out there, you know. Especially Chinese culture. Yeah. Children are so forced. To, you have to learn. You have to do good in school. <laughs> <laughs> Only way you're going to make it in this life. <laughs> you got to go to university. You got to be the best in your class. You got to get the highest degree you can. And then so many in Chinese culture. So many children are depressed. Because they're, they're out seeking to please their parents. Right? And many of you still carry baggage from when you were a child. And your father, and just, you have to learn. You have to learn. And yet when it comes to Christ, none of that fervor is there. Mm -hmm. That's true. Oh yeah, I know it's true. true. Nobody has to amen it. Yeah. <laughs> it's true anyway. It's true. It's very true. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't learn. But our priority is to learn Christ. Amen. That's why even when I was at school, that one time when Jesus appeared to me, because uh, all I did was spend my time with him and I wouldn't go to class, he came and gave me the answers to a test. He was impressed. With, oh, he's really trying to learn here. Let me help him out. All right? <laughs> So, Matthew chapter 3. Let's, let's look at this. Because, you know, after the excitement passes, there's going to be testing. How many of you know you're going to go into a great test after I leave? Already started. Already started, see? I'm going to go through a great test when I leave. We all are. Yeah. Let's just let it let it be settled. Yeah. We're going to be tested. Yeah. Because the Lord is making us responsible. He's saying, you know, I, I really want to know him like I've never known him before. <coughs> but, okay, well this is what you have to learn. I'm gonna bring it out through trial. <laughs> and here's what Jesus said, you know, I already told you these things so that you would have peace. All of these trials, tribulation, they will happen. But I told you ahead of time. Why? So that in me, you would have peace. I've already overcome. I will cause you to overcome. So then when the trials come, again, we're not begging God to get us out of the trial. We're asking him to come in and do what he has to in us. Amen. Amen. 
Amen, everybody. Amen. 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 Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. It says, Then comes Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of you, and you're coming to me? And Jesus answered and said, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You know, isn't this such a wonderful scene? How many can agree? I bet that Jesus felt really good at this time. And, and, and all of us want experiences like that, you know. We went down, and, and the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit just came down and rested on us. And then we heard the affirmation of our Father that says, This is my beloved one. I am well pleased with him. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Don't you get, just get all the warm and fuzzies and all the goodness? Yeah. And you're like, Lord, hug me and don't let me go. <laughs> and then we get to Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. So immediately after we hear from the Lord, says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And why was he well pleased with Jesus? Because he learned. Pastor Lee was talking about it. You know, when we say childlike, we're not just talking about, oh, children will believe anything you tell them. He's talking about the ability to learn. Just soak it all in. And so when we say, okay, let's come to him as a child, that's when we say, Lord, it doesn't matter what I know. If you say something different, I will abandon that for you. <laughs> That is true childlike faith. I am willing to abandon all that I've ever known to come into you, into the knowledge of the Son of God. Doesn't matter how much I was taught before. When you are ready to deal with the old wineskin, Lord, destroy it and make me new. That's the only way we're going to advance in this. We'll get to some more specifics. But let's look at what happened here. Verse 1, it says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now let's look at the language. After all of this warm and fuzzy that just happened, all this goodness that was shown upon the Lord Jesus, who led him into the wilderness? <laughs> Who drove him out there into a dry place? Right? The Lord. The, the Spirit of God drove him out to the wilderness. So guess who's going to take you into the dry place after this is all over? It's not the devil. It's the Lord. It's okay. Now we need to test what's in you. Let's see if there was a learning, if there was growth. You know, we don't really know where you stand until you're tested. Isn't that how you advance in school? It doesn't matter how long you sat under the teacher. Say, so, okay, now let's take the test. Let's see how much it stuck. Right? So Jesus being led into the wilderness to be by the Lord to be tempted of the devil, to be tested. And verse 2, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward very hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If you be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. What was the first thing he attacked? Satan attacked the word of the Lord. We just saw in Matthew chapter 3. And saying, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. So guess what Jesus didn't have to do? 
He didn't have to perform anything to prove that he was uh, pleasing to his father. There's no performance necessary. So then when the tempter came, the first test that happened, if you really are the son of God, do this. If it's real, you would do this. And Jesus' response is what's important. Again, he answered and said unto him, verse 4, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. His response was because of the word that richly dwelled in him. It wasn't an emotional response. It wasn't, let's call the prayer team together. It wasn't, Lord, confirm your word again and again and again. I want to make sure it was you. It wasn't any of that. It was, this is what he said, and this is where I stand. Amen. Period. You know, Jesus was very hungry. Mm-hmm. And he wasn't able to resist because he was the Son of God. He resisted because he had been filled with the knowledge of God's Word. Can we hear that? Because what happens is that people, they look at the Lord Jesus in this time on the earth and they say, well, of course that was Jesus. And here's what they mean. I can't do that. Because that was God doing it. When he's saying, of course, and he wants to do it in you. Amen. Amen. Are we still here? That after you have received the word of the Lord, after all the wonderful feelings, then comes testing of the very word that you received. And this is where Jesus, he said, you know, understand this parable. This is the parable of all parables, right? When When the word is sown, to see if you truly understand, Satan comes immediately to take it. Can I help you on spiritual warfare 101? I want to help you out. I'll tell you exactly why devils do what they do. Because they're allowed to. Okay? The Bible says that we overcome evil with good. So we don't have to scream at the devil. We just obey God. Isn't that good? Yeah. See, now you don't have to know all these different tactics. <laughs> Knowing his word will teach you. Taking in more and more what he said will grant you. And that's why he could tell uh, uh, the disciples, you know, when you stand before them, you won't have to premeditate what you'll say. I'll give you what to say at that same time Why? Because his words were in them. Furthermore, when it comes to spiritual warfare, dealing with the issues of life, here's what I learned from a friend of mine, and what I started to see put into practice was a wonderful thing. You know, once, here's the truth of it. Once you really come into the knowledge of Jesus Christ, devils don't want to mess with you. <coughs> They're forced to. Say it so you can When you really come into the knowledge, huh? Yeah, I'll repeat it. When you come into the knowledge of the Son of God, devils don't want to mess with you anymore. They're forced to. God makes them come after you. (laughs) He makes them. Okay. I don't think it was the English. I think it was the statement itself. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. Because everybody's like, what do you mean God will make them come after me? I'll explain. <laughs> he will make the devil come to try you. Yeah, right. 
He will make him come test you. Yes. And he doesn't want to. And I'll tell you why. Because the Lord would trap them into judgment. You know, if they're allowed to just do whatever they want to do, they'll just keep tormenting you, tormenting you, tormenting you. And they get a good kick out of it. But once you come into the knowledge of the Son of God, they don't want to mess with you because they know that punishment will follow. And here's what I learned to pray on those lines. Okay, Lord, make them pay for what they're doing. Don't let them go without consequence. I have seen angels who were happy to oblige. Lord, I want them to think twice before they come back to do it again. Many of them go around with no consequence. I started seeing this happen when the Lord would, would test me. Okay, here's what I've taught you, Slater. Now let's get tested. And I would see devils scream because they didn't want to be the one to come do it. He showed it to me once. Seeing them scream, like, no, send him. I don't want to go, send him. And they'd be, you know, you have to go. Because they knew there would be consequences. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. That's why we're not afraid. They're afraid. They're afraid of him getting to his people. So if I can stop them. See, the enemy doesn't mind you coming to church. You know, we can go to church years after year after year after year and never learn Christ. And so the enemy is satisfied by keeping us in that cage. But once the increase of the sun happens in you, that's when you become a real threat. And you become a threat because now you get to execute judgment upon them. For example, I'll tell you such a spirit that this happened to. Happened a few years ago in uh, St. Louis. The spirit of murder appeared to me. And uh, after that whole thing in Ferguson that happened a few years ago, and we didn't know, you know, what happened for real and why it happened. And uh, the Lord was trying to get at us as it pertained to uh, being gatekeepers of the city. And, uh, and so we began to pray. So many angels had came down. It was over one million that were there. And uh, they came down and they began to fight back the darkness. And so, a little while after that happened, um, you know, there was still rioting going on every night um, in, in Ferguson, and then in different parts of St. Louis. And uh, murder appeared to, to me one night and stood outside the church. I was, I was standing in the church, and I looked out into the lobby, and murder was standing right outside the doors, you know, big glass yeah. doors and all that. So murder was standing right outside the door and just looking at me with great disgust. And when I went to ask the Lord, I said, well, what is this? I called um, those who were part of the midnight prayer and said, you know, murder had came up here. Let's, let's get before the Lord. The Lord said, now I want to deal with that spirit in this city. All right, so... We, we begin, you know, to pray, you know, ask the Lord how He wanted us to do this. And um, it was a really gruesome battle. But, of course, murder ended up losing, <laughs> of course. And um, what happened was, here's what the Lord said to me about it. Every time this spirit wants to rear its head, so said, now I'll let you crush it. All right? He said, just like the serpent coming to uh, bruise the hill, You'll crush his head every time. And so uh, St. Louis is one of the murder, cap murder capitals of the U.S. and subsequent of the world. And uh, we had an experience. We were, we were meeting one night. This was last year. We were meeting one night, and um, they started rioting 
right across the street from where we were meeting earlier this. And uh, so the police were in, you know, all their full guard, and they had their big, you know, shields and all that. And then there were protesters, like, screaming at them on the other side. And they were organizing all of these uh, protests around the city, just randomly showing up to different places, blocking off traffic, and uh, wanting to, you know, loot and, you know, commit all kind of atrocities. And uh, a police officer uh, was killed at one point. People were getting hurt. All this. So this particular Wednesday night, we were, uh, we were there, and they were forming right outside. And I said, well, Lord, I know this is not by chance. They just want to come where we are meeting, you know, because then we were going to be locked up. Because God knows how long they would have been out there protesting. And I, I told our group, I said, okay, we're going to pray because now I'm angry. Now I'm really upset. And I saw that spirit out there. And I said, okay, y'all, we're going to pray. But, you know, whatever the Lord is saying to us, we'll, we'll pray out. So we began to pray. Within seconds of opening our mouths to pray, the protesters dispersed. They all left. Amen. They did not accomplish what they wanted to do. And that spirit screamed at me. Because I wouldn't let it do what it wanted to do. I said, okay, Lord. Now send your angels to punish that spirit. Haven't seen it since. Now, I bring all this up because of what the Lord is endeavoring to do in us. That if we would come into the knowledge of the Son of God, we could truly rule and reign with Him. And so then when you are tested by the Lord, because He's going to make them come, when you are tested by the Lord, they will come in great fear. Because they know they will be punished for what they do. It is the Lord's trap for them. It's exactly what He did with Job. He, uh, the Lord said to Sam, yeah, you can do what you want to. You just can't kill him. And, and Satan caused so much havoc in Job's life. And what did it do? It drove Job right to the Lord. And the Lord was able to deal with Job and then exact judgment on Satan who was opposing him. You know, he's still licking his wounds from that. He hasn't forgotten what happened there. Neither has the Lord. And he wants to be able to do that in us because we are filled with the knowledge of the Son of God. In other words, filled with what he's filled with, the very life of God, through this written word. Because consumption of his words is so important. If he's going to build his family, his family name, his house, it's okay, I got it. He's going to build his house. We have to know his ways. We have to know the truth. We have to know him as he is. So when Jesus was being tempted, right, the, the devil didn't just, I'll tell you what happened here. The devil didn't just come to him and then Jesus withstood him and then the devil just got to go away. Nothing happened to him. He was punished. This is why, you know, after that, when Jesus would go places and devils would see him, they scream. Why have you come to torment us before our time? What are you doing here? What are you going to do to us? Because there was punishment given. <sighs> can, can we hear that? Let's go to First Peter. First Peter chapter two. Uh, no, let's let's go to chapter one. Let's do that. We'll drop down to verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. 
it reads, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. <laughs> we'll come back to that. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Let's, let's deal with this now. Your souls are purified in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love for the brethren. See how God doesn't separate growth in Jesus Christ from growth in his family. Body is connected here. So the more Christ fills you, the more love you will have for the brethren. We'll see this again. It says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God. So how are we born again, or born from above? By his word. We believed on the word of God. And that seed, which is incorruptible, came in. And it says, lives and abides forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. And the grass withers, and the flower thereof falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So the gospel is not preached without understanding of his word. Chapter 2, verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, and all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speakings, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God, and precious, you also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So he says, you know, when you first come to him, you are to desire. And here's where we see a lot of error. No one desires to learn. No one desires to hear what he's actually saying. Remember uh, Luke chapter 10 with Mary and Martha? And, and Martha was all about serving, serving, serving. And she was so stressed out by the servant that she wanted Jesus to rebuke Mary to come and help her. But Mary was just sitting at his feet to hear what he had to say. And he rebuked Martha. You know, Martha, you, you're doing all these things, but one thing you have is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part. And it will not be taken away from her. Because she desired to hear. May the Lord give us all ears that hear. Because how many times are these things said, but so few a response from the people of God to actually come out to it? Right? I've learned more and more and more. I'll just give you how I feel on this. If the Lord took away all experiences from me, if I never had another one, if I never saw Jesus in a vision again, or an angel or a demon, it would not stop me from going, growing. As a matter of fact, I'd probably grow faster. Because all I would have is to depend on what he said. So be encouraged. We, we know, me and Pastor Lee know people personally who have visions of Jesus every single day and still don't know him. Still don't know what he wants. You see how we can fall into things? I would rather have this and continue to feast upon the words which testify of him, which points us to him, than to have all the experiences that can be tainted by my own soul. Just because I have an experience doesn't mean I understand it. I've had many experiences that puzzle me. Hey, Lord, what does that actually mean? And then when the Lord would say something to me, I'm always asking him to verify this in the scriptures. Why? So I can stand with him. 
You know, that's the mistake a lot of these prophets make. Just believe me because I said it. Just believe me because I had the experience. What did he tell Jehoshaphat? Believe the Lord your God. Believe everything he says. So shall you be established. Then, believe the prophets. Then you'll prosper. In other words, the prophet will point out in this where you already established where to go now. Okay, this is what the Lord said he wanted. And we can, we can all say amen to it because we're already established right in here. The prophet didn't come first. It was the word of the Lord. Isaiah learned that. Isaiah, as a matter of fact, Isaiah told me. He said, until I had the experience where the angel cleansed my lips, I wasn't speaking the right thing. I wasn't preaching the word of the Lord. We have to be cleansed. Amen. Amen. And how has that happened? Jesus said, I clean you through the word that I speak to you. We have to give reverence to God and that he was so gracious to write the scriptures out for us. And others who were tested and proven and used to write these scriptures. But he gave them all to us. None of us had to go through the testing they went through to get this to the people. It's already here. So now let's honor the Lord. All right, I saw a video some years ago of uh, an underground church in China where they didn't have any Bibles. Uh, like one person had a Bible, you know, um, they would teach you know, many, many hours of the day. And then they brought in Bibles and they opened those boxes and all these precious Chinese people were screaming and crying and hugging the Bible and kissing it because they're like, we finally get to have a copy of his testimony. Each one, they, they so appreciated the Lord because they had the scripture. How, how much more will we come to judgment before the Lord because it's so widely available? We can put it on our phones, he puts it up on the screen, we have a hard copy, we have CDs and, and tapes where you can just listen. <laughs> And yet we don't want to. We don't desire the sincere or the truth of God's word so that we can grow. Mm -hmm. yes. So after the conference, after we leave, after you won't see us for God knows how long, <coughs> then he's going to test us by what's been deposited in you. So I, I'm going to put you on the spot, Corey. <laughs> was that last year or the year before? All the years. Uh, huh? All the years. All the years. <laughs> <laughs> I came and uh, Corey said, Slater, pray for me. I said, what's wrong? And he was in pain or something. Oh, you remember that? And I said, why didn't you pray? And he said, all I could think of was, well, I'm not worried about it because Slater's coming. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, Corin, I have failed you. If you think I got to come for this to happen, we're totally off. I said, no, you're going to pray. <laughs> you're going to trust him. You're going to believe him. You can't do it because I believe him. You have to trust him. You have to know yourself what he said. <clears throat> Right? Which is why I, I even stop, unless the Lord explicitly tells me to. Which, since I gave it up, he hasn't. And I'm so grateful. Uh, Slater, can we pray together? And then you tell me if the Lord approves of this or not. And once I gave it, because I used to do that all the time. we pray, I would see those things. And I'd say, okay, here's your answer. And what did it do? Just made them depend on me. Instead of the Lord. Yeah. So I'm like, and, I, and I'm honest with people now, like, you know what? Of course we can pray. I can pray for you, and we'll let the Lord speak to you. 
Because it wasn't until I went to him and I wanted to learn that I actually started to learn. All right, so then the growth comes in, and we'll see this uh, again in Hebrews chapter 5. Let's look back there. Thank you so much. You know, Louisa is my friend. I uh, always enjoy seeing her whenever I come. I'm always scared to open the bottle because sometimes sometimes my own strength gets the best of me and I'm squeezing with both hands and then it you know, spits out. But thank you, Lisa. Um, so Ephesians 5. Let's look at this growth here. Ephesians, oh, not Ephesians, Hebrews 5, I'm sorry, thank you. I'm looking at Hebrews and saying Ephesians. I just love the book of Ephesians, it's one of my favorites. So, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. So Paul is, is rebuking... <laughs> The Hebrews, because he's saying, listen, I want to move on with you. But because you won't take seriously what's already been said, we can't even talk about it. <coughs> you know, I, I, uh, years ago, um, I'll tell you what started me on this journey. Um, when I was in Mississippi, the pastor said one time, you know, there's so much that the Lord has been teaching me lately, but I can't because none of you have really grasped the foundation yet. So we have to keep going back to the foundation until you get it. And I, I was offended. I said, no, I want to know, because I get it. <laughs> and, he said, and he said to me, in front of everybody, he said, especially you, Slater, <laughs> you don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, Lord, why would you do that to me? <laughs> and that, that pricked my understanding, or, or, or my heart to want to learn. And so I said, Lord, I never want you to be able to say to me again, so I want to move on with you. But you have a hard time with this right here. How can I give you even uh, uh, an, an inch closer to me when you won't take seriously this right here that I've already given to you? So that started me. I, I said, okay, no, I really want to learn. I really want to know. So if I have to call you out, who needs to be called out? <laughs> Right? Especially you, Alice. I don't get it. <laughs> May it work with you too. Especially you, Serena. Right? <laughs> so that he could grasp our attention. So you know what? If you really want to go there with me, you can. But you got to learn what I've already said to you. You have to already take it seriously. Yes? <laughs> you got that, Alice? You got it. Because <laughs> I want to see in all of us. I, I, told, I told our group one night we were praying together and we began to pray for one another. And I said to them, Listen, I am committed fully to see Christ formed in you. Amen. As long as you don't give up, it doesn't matter what happened, I'm committed to you to see Christ formed in you. And they repeated to me, No matter what happens, I am committed to you to see Christ formed in you. So even when issues arise between members of our group, everybody has to remember the commitment and cover one another so that Christ can have his way, so that we can learn, so we can grow, right? <clears throat> he says, verse 12, for when, for the, for when, for when, for the time, you ought to be teachers. You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. It says, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. In other words, he's saying, it's hard for babes to grasp the truth. 
He said, but strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised or trained to discern both good and evil. Let me tell you what that means. Here's what the Lord said to me. He said, you have to train naked. I'll tell you what that means. Because it's nothing perverted. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> he said, you have to allow me to tell you where the flaws are. Amen. He said, you have to allow me to have straight talk with you. So that you can discern between good and evil. You know, in Canada, in the U.S., we have a hard time saying him when it's a man and her when it's a woman. Even they don't know who they are. Right? So then he says, those who are mature can discern between good and evil. And it seems like, oh, simple enough. But then when he starts to describe what good is and what evil is, everybody has a problem. We want to conform to accommodate people who are confused. I don't care what they do to me. We are not to compromise the truth. So, so if you if you want to eat, you know you ever seen babies? You give them the milk, and they're having the milk, but they're saying you eat solid food, mm -hmm. and they want it, and you're like, no, you can't handle it yet. Yeah. And they're crying and screaming, and you're like, no, I already know, you can't handle it. Mm -hmm. Right? So we ignore that cry, and now you have your milk. Here. <laughs> <laughs> because you know they're just babies. Mm -hmm. They have to grow to eat solid food. Yeah. Right? They can't digest it yet. You look Lord and saying to him, Lord, I want to know. He's like, okay, drink this milk. I don't want that. No, drink this milk. And this is how the Lord had to start teaching me. Okay, Slater, let's start at the beginning. This, and here's where he started with me. This is the new covenant. I know what the new covenant is. <laughs> Jesus died for me. I'm assured of heaven. And he, that's not the new covenant. <laughs> He started me there. What is the covenant, Slater? What is this new covenant? And when I would go to answer, he said, first, you have to understand the old one. Let's go back. And I'm like, well, I thought we were, you know, I graduated valedictorian in Bible school. <laughs> I did. It's top of my class. <laughs> Shouldn't I know these things? I even went back to teach at that school. said, so you don't understand the Old Covenant. He said, so, and he, he proved it to me, because when others came to tell me, it's not really the Old Covenant, it's a renewed covenant. He said, they throw you off because you don't get it. So I had to go back. Okay, Lord, let's start at the beginning. Let's see what actually happened. And you know, like I told you before, the depth and the complexity of learning Christ comes from the simplicity of it. Just to be simply devoted to Him, you'll go deeper and deeper and deeper. Deeper doesn't mean it sounds complicated, like we try to make it. It becomes extremely simple, just like when the Lord would teach. His teachings were extremely simple, yet many could not grasp them. They were looking for something else. You know, Jesus, when are you going to go into the mysticism of it all? When are we going to have, you know, let's, let's go way out there, because I'm ready. And then he'll say something like, love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. And I respond, well, they don't deserve it. <laughs> you see how we're not ready? See how those things, it, he had to uh, rebuke his disciples over this. Jesus told them, you know, 
uh, you know, go out, you know, two by two into all these cities, and I want you to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. I want you to preach, you know, the kingdom of God is at hand. And without question, they went out and did it. Then Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain or to this tree, be removed, throw yourself into the sea. He says, so likewise now, forgive those who wrong you. And what was their response? Luke chapter 17, they said, Lord, increase our faith. We can believe you for those miracles, but we can't believe you to forgive someone. And that's why he brought it right back down to the beginning every time. Right to them. Because when it came to doing all the mighty works, we love signing up for those classes. When he says, you must forgive all of those who wrong you. You must not hold anything against anyone, ever. And we said, Lord, I have a hard time believing that. Increase my faith. How horrible is that? So, I can imagine the great frustration of our Lord Jesus having to constantly go over this again with them. And how many times have we been told? Yeah. Uh, who's been saved more than 10 years? More than 20. More than 30. That's a good 40? <laughs> are, you, uh, are you asking 50? how old we are? <laughs> Over 50? What about 60? No 60? How long? I'm 75 now. I was born again when I was 21 years old. 21. So what is that? Uh, 50? 54. 54, yeah? Wow. So even, let's use our brother for an example. 54 years of walking with the Lord. And yet we still have to be told, forgive them. 54 years? That speaks to our shame. Right? When the Lord would have to tell us, uh, you know what? Bless them that curse you. Don't retaliate. You see how, how much self comes into the picture and just rules the heart of man. But he said, those who are mature, here's a marker of maturity, they can discern between good and evil. They can make judgment calls. You know, if we're going to rule and reign with him, we have to be able to make the call. And what I've learned in my walk with him, sometimes the Lord doesn't outright tell me. He expects me to figure it out. He says, okay, so I brought you to a point. I want you to make a judgment call here. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Lord, it'd be better if you just tell me. <laughs> Wouldn't that be better? Like, just tell me everything. <laughs> right? And he said, I can spoon feed you like a baby, but then you'd be a baby. Or you can pick up the fork and knife and feed yourself. Mm -hmm. That's how he said it to me. Mm -hmm. So then when it came to making certain judgment calls, I just say, okay, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> and they said, did the Lord tell you that? I say, no, he didn't. And we're not going to do it. And I was like, okay, don't. But this is what we're going to do here. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to make this judgment call based on relationship already. Because this is in my heart. It's not just words on the page. It is inscribed on the heart. Yes? Amen. And I find, whether I make the right decision or not, that the Lord begins to trust me more and more with himself. And here's why. Here's what the Lord said. He appeared to me after one such decision one day, and I was completely wrong in my decision. I was wrong. And the Lord appeared to me. He stood there. He said, you were wrong. This was the decision you were supposed to make. Mm -hmm. He said, but because you considered everything I had taught you mm -hmm. and really tried to navigate through this, he said, today I'll promote you. Wow. That's Even when I got it wrong. Wow. Now that didn't just give me a license just to frivolously make decisions, mm -hmm. but he plunged me 
He said, because you kept considering what I would do, what I said already, yeah. and made a judgment call based on that. He said, now I can trust you to know the truth. Mm. I can trust myself with you. Wow. Isn't he a wonderful teacher? Yes. Even though I had it wrong, <laughs> the process in which I went through to make a decision was what he was pleased with. Amen. The outcome didn't really matter to him at that point. Mm -hmm. Now it will, eventually, as I continue to grow in the knowledge of the Son of God. Right? That's when I started to learn about, you know, devils having to pay for what they did. Mm -hmm. See, when I, pay for, when I pray for people, and uh, like something was going on, I said, okay, Lord, make sure that those devils pay for what they did. Mm. So they think twice about coming back. Mm. And these are some of those things you, you go on to learn, mm. right, as we learn Christ. Yeah. What he did, he executed judgment upon them all in the cross. Mm. That's why he let, he let it get as brutal that they could make it when he gave his life for us. Because there in the cross, he made an open show of them. So he paraded them around, and they felt all the shame. Because had they known, they'd have never even went through with it. He catches them in their own folly. See, that's why, that's how we come to understand those scriptures. What, what Satan may have meant for evil, God meant it for our good. Because what is Satan out to do? To destroy you. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. Isn't that right? Yeah. But those who would turn to the Lord, whatever he does, the Lord will turn for good. Because it will be the increase of his Son in us increase of the knowledge of God. Why? Because we spend time consuming more and more and more of His words. And His words are dwelling richly in us. I'll tell you something ridiculous that happened here recently. I got into a big argument with a friend over a scripture. Some thing he was teaching. And I called him out on it. We got into this really big argument over it. And he had another brother there for accountability. And he says to me, Sir, I'll tell you how I know that you're wrong. He said, Because the scripture says, out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, that every word be established. I, I bear witness in my heart that this is true. He bears witness in his heart that this is true. This is two witnesses, so we're right, you're wrong. <laughs> and I told him, I said, I can go get four people right now who agree with me. Then what? <laughs> I told him, I said, you don't see how deceived you really are. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? I said, what about Jim Jones? He had a whole city of people drink the Kool-Aid and die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they all agreed. Mm -hmm. Didn't make it right. Mm -hmm. Or the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Many of us are not familiar with Jim Jones. Jim Jones. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Jim Jones was a Pentecostal preacher. Here, here's the danger of emotionalism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what was this, back in the 70s? Yeah. I think so. 70s, 80s? So uh, Jim Jones, he, uh, he was a very charismatic speaker. His church was huge. That's from there, yeah. Everyone loved him. Uh, and he was, he was a very bold guy, and then he got off into deception. And he thought himself to be God. Right? So he moved a whole group of people from, I think they were in Los Angeles at first, mm -hmm. and moved them to South America, in Guyana. Yeah. Right? And he built what, what was called Jonestown. Uh, and a whole city of people, he ruled with an iron fist. Because whatever he said, they believed. And even when they wanted to leave, he would severely punish them. And so then, when a U.S. senator found out what he was doing, he went down there to meet him uh, to uh, bring charges against Jim Jones. 
And so he made everyone drink poison and then ended up committing suicide. <laughs> and everyone followed him because of how much charisma he had yeah. and how he could twist the scriptures. That's why Christ <laughs> must be the focus. Amen. Yes. If we don't have Christ as the focus, we're going to get way off. Uh, okay, I don't want to be racial here or anything, but we're all Chinese in here. For the most part. <laughs> <laughs> Do we know what a... Uh, uh, a trajectory is, yeah. right? So then you know, like, you know, when you use a compass to draw the circles, um, you know that trajectory is important, right? Because even if you are just a little bit off, one millimeter off, that trajectory ends up being way off at the end. Even if you say, "Oh, that's not that really, that's not that much of a big deal," we can we can take that. So before it's all over with, you'll be way off. You'll miss the mark completely. Isn't that what sin is? Mm -hmm. Missing the mark. So the issue of sin in the heart isn't the act itself. It's when we don't hit the mark. And who's the mark? Christ. That's why we press toward the mark of our high heavenly calling in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's pray this real quick. You know, this is why I pray for all of you. Lord, let each one of us come to the mind of abandonment of everything that we have learned before so that we can learn you. Amen. Amen. Yeah. That's an important prayer to come into agreement with, with the Lord. Lord, no matter what it is, if I was wrong, I didn't have the right understanding, please correct me. You know, that's an a expression of God's love, is to correct you. Right? Don't you correct your children? Good parents? All right. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 6 then, since we're already here, verse 1. And Paul is going to lay out those elementary principles, or elementary doctrines of Christ. Here you see how far we call it. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, you have people who refuse to repent now. This is the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. And a faith towards God, just to simply believe and trust Him, is the beginning. Mm -hmm. He says, of the doctrine of baptisms, and laying on of hands. You know, when I was coming up, we thought the person was really close to God if they could lay hands and people fall out. <laughs> <laughs> You know, as I got older, we see most of them were pushed now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we used to. And then if you didn't fall, they really pushed. <laughs> Are you going down today, buddy? <laughs> we thought that was really spiritual. Am I saying it's unspiritual to fall? No, I'm not. If Christ knocks you out, be knocked out. <laughs> But here's where I have issue with people. What happened to you when you got up? What change happened in you when you got off the floor? That's when I know something really happened. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, laying on hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. All these things are the very beginning. And if somebody talks about them, we think they're going very deep when they are the first step. So, I want to give you 15 things here. It's going to help you in 
growth with Christ. And I'm going to uh, quote them to you. We definitely don't have time to go through all of this. So I want to at least give you all 15. Okay? And you can read all of them in order from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. These are called Psalms of Ascent. Going up higher. Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. Before, let's go to Psalm 24. I want to help increase you in your learning. And these are things that I was never taught by man. And, and you see, when the Lord gets involved, he shows you how simple it is. And you're like, man, it was there the whole time. It was right there in my face. Yeah. Yet I could not see. Uh-huh. <laughs> it takes the Lord to unveil. You know, that's, again, we talked about this earlier, that the function of the Holy Spirit in us is to unveil Christ. Amen. Amen. It's not to give us certain feelings. Or certain suspicions. This is what the Lord had to, you know, deal with me. You know, I meet a lot of people who tell me, you know, Slater, here's my gift. My gift is the gift of discernment. I have great discernment. Here's what, and, and as I was being told this one day, the Lord Jesus stood, stood next to this lady. And he said to me, he said, she's not full of discernment. She's full of suspicion. He says, so it is with the majority of my people. Wow. They think they're discerning when they're really just suspicious people. Mm. Wow. You know, I don't get a good vibe from that person. Yeah. Just, you know, I've had this gift since I was a little kid <laughs> to be able to discern, yeah. right? So I could tell you if you were, you know, really not a good person, like I just knew about you. And here's what the Lord had to say to me about it. They're suspicious. Mm. They're not discerning. Wow. That's when he began to explain to me the true discerning of spirits to be able to see if what is, is coming forth its source is God or that person. That's true discerning of spirits. Where's the source coming from? Even if you if you say something that's true, here's how the Lord showed it to me. Remember the girl who uh, the soothsayer who followed Paul around? <laughs> These men know the truth. <laughs> They come from the Most High God. What was wrong with what she said? The source from which it came. And so Paul was so grieved, he cast the devil out of her. So just because someone says something that, that seems true, doesn't mean the source was God. It could be from their own hearts. They could be being exploited by devils, like that girl was. We got a lot to learn, don't we? <laughs> I hope this is sobering for you. Because we want to learn, we want to grow. We want the increase of the measure of Christ in us. And it doesn't come out of excitement. It comes when he, he starts tweaking things in you. Starts pointing things out. Starts challenging you. You know, I, I had a talk with, um, with Terry Bennett one time. He said, you know, Slater... I was uh, in a council meeting one time. He said, and all the uh, apostles, there, there, were, there was 12 apostles, so it was the 11 um, apostles of the Lamb and then Paul. Was in there. He said, 12 of them were sitting there, and he said, we were sitting at a round table, and all of them were grilling me on what I was teaching from their books. Wow. Wow. So you think you know this? <laughs> you think you know what I meant when I said that? <laughs> and hammered his doctrine one by one, scripture by scripture. He said he had 12 encounters with God. And he told me, he said, Slater, I would have rather died than to sit through that. But I was being challenged by the Lord on what I was preaching and where my focus was. And thinking because of my experiences, I knew what they were talking about when I didn't know it all. I was, I was preaching in Illinois a year ago. And 
when I stood up, I was, I was very nervous. And there was, like, there was something going on. I was kind of rubbing my belly like Clement is. <laughs> and I was like really, really nervous. And as soon as I stood up, as soon as I stood up, my eyes opened. And I saw Jeremiah. I saw the Lord Jesus. I saw Elijah. I saw several people. Ezekiel was there. They were all standing there. And here's what Jeremiah said to me. He said, today you're on the chopping block. We're all coming to watch what you're going to say. And I said, this cannot be. I told Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was the one who came up to me. And the Lord Jesus was standing there. And he, would, he didn't even address me. Jeremiah was addressing me. He said, we're going to see if you preach the right message. We're coming to test what you're saying. I was terrified. <laughs> so I wasn't nervous because there's, there's the nervousness I get every time before I have to go and preach somewhere. And I was nervous this morning. But this nervousness was different, and I recognized it was very different. And so when I stood up there, and I was like saying hello to everyone and all that, going through all my preliminaries, that's when they appeared. So okay, you're on the chopping block today, so. <laughs> Can you be faithful with the testimony? of our Lord Jesus. So Jeremiah said, and they were all standing there watching. There were some I didn't even recognize. And they were standing there listening to every single word. And Jeremiah told me, he said, you know, you will be judged for every idle word. He said, in other words, later, whatever you say here that's unfruitful, the Lord will bring account to you about it. I told Jeremiah, I said, get me out of here. <laughs> I said, please, couldn't we have done this at home? Why? When I'm up here standing, and I'm, 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 I'm like standing there with Jeremiah, and I'm, I'm going through all my preliminaries, so I'm like smiling at everybody, but I'm having this conversation with Jeremiah, and I'm looking at the Lord and everyone who's standing there, I'm like, can't we do this at home? <laughs> we have to do this now? <laughs> How am I going to say anything when y'all are just staring at me? Because <laughs> now I'm afraid to speak. Yeah. And here's what Jeremiah said. You ought to tremble at his words. Yeah. That's what he said. I started to get it. Like, oh, yeah, there has to be a holy reverence here. I'm not just preaching. Yeah. Just to be preaching. People are going to hear the Lord, they're not. The blood is going to be on my hands of this or not. So, yeah, so be careful, all you preachers. <laughs> they're paying attention to see if we can be found worthy to work with. Why not? Can we work with them? Even if you don't see them, the family of heaven and earth must work together. And they have to see what we're actually saying. And if we are worthy to carry the testimony. Yes. If we're worthy to carry the ark of his glory. I told Terry, I said, well, I didn't have it as bad as you. That was a one-time thing. I hope it never happens again like that. I hope I learned. And that'll all be tested. Still to this day, I told our group, I said, listen, the Lord will hold me accountable for everything I teach to you. So if you're tired of me repeating Jesus Christ, leave and get over it. Because when he judges me, I want him to be able to say, well done. Good and faithful servant. In other words, you were faithful with the covenant. You were faithful with my testimony. You truly prophesied. Amen. Amen. So, Psalm 24. In verse 3 it says, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He gives us the answer here. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, but has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek your face, 
O Jacob, Selah. So, he's given us the answer here. Who's actually going to go up the mountain of the Lord? Who's actually going to stand in that holy place with him? And here's what he means. He doesn't just mean salvation. He's talking about those who will be given the right to judge the nations of the world. Those who will be given responsibility over all the peoples of the earth and who will be given the responsibility to carry the testimony of our Lord to all of creation. See how important purity is. Holiness and righteousness. And by that I mean Christ fulfilling that in you. Not you trying to do this on your own. But by Christ coming in and being all in all in us. So let me give you these, these, these steps up this mountain. Here. So again, they are Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. These are called the Songs of Ascent. Right? Here's what the Lord pointed out to me with them. So I will, I will give you the major theme of all of those songs, but I encourage you to be a good student and go and drench yourself in them. Okay? So let's ascend up the holy hill of the Lord. And we'll see the journey of our lives with him in this. Number one, Psalm 120, is repentance. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. See, you already knew the first step, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Can't go up the mountain except you first repent. Mm -hmm. Psalm 121, or number two, understanding God as our protection. He will keep us in this journey. This journey is filled with great danger, but he will keep us in it. So we don't have to be afraid to walk with him in it. Remember, Jesus said, these things will happen that in me you will have peace, be of good cheer, because I have already overcome the world. And in, in, in the Greek, what he really said, I have over, overcome the world and its system. It's way of doing it. I've already overcome it. So just walk in me. Okay? Psalm 122, or number 3, is true worship or governance. Who has the authority over you? Do we even know what the, the word Lord actually means? It means supreme in authority. That's why knowing Jesus is our Savior isn't enough. He must become Lord in your heart. He must reign supreme in you. It's the only way this is going to work. And here's what the Lord told me. He said, many people don't get past number 30 there. Wow. <laughs> because he's not really Lord of them. And here's how the Lord said it to me. He said, they don't ascribe to my teaching. How do you put it? Wow. He said, I'm not Lord, because they don't listen to what I say. Wow. Simple, but deep. Number four. What's the next one? Psalm 123? Yeah. Is obedience to what he said. See? He has to be the, the Lord over you, and then you must obey. Obedience and longing. This is where our true desire comes in, where we desire Him. Psalm 123, that's number four. Again, go back and just drown yourself in it. Right? Let it be water to swim in. You'll see, you'll see the journey coming out in its fullness in this. Number five, or Psalm 124. Understanding that God is our help and our deliverance. He starts to get at the issues of the heart. He starts to really deal with us and become our deliverance. He truly becomes Savior. And He's Savior because He is Lord. Does that make sense? He can save us from ourselves because He reigns supreme in us. 
And the only way any of this works is by understanding. We have to have, we have to stand on the firm foundation of this for it to actually work in us for the inner workings of the cross. Number six, or Psalm 125, is being stable. <laughs> Our stability is Christ Jesus. This one, he starts to deal with people who can't commit. They go back and forth because of circumstance. So if you really want to follow me now, I have to become stable. I have to become your stability. We're going to make it. This is just step six, right? There's 15 here. <laughs> and what's the, the bottom line of stability? Trust. That's why he says, you know what, if you believe me, ask me in faith and don't doubt. Because he that wavers is unstable in all their ways. Just believe me. I want you to trust me when I say something. And here's the biggest trust factor of it all, that he's able to be all in all in us. Not trusting him for things, but trusting him to be all of himself in us. That's a big struggle in our lives. Because most of all, we don't think it's possible. <laughs> that's what he has to deal with in us. To really understand. That's, that's why he started to challenge me. He says later, with God, all things are possible to him who believes. He said, you don't believe that, do you? Of course, Lord, I believe. He said, okay, well, let me do it. And when you go back in to take over, you're showing that you trust in yourself and not me. You trust in your own ability to get the job done. And you already know it's impossible. <laughs> you know, that's why you can't just claim a scripture. It has to become real. And meditating something like that, God with you, all things are possible. That's a meditation that can last forever. Because it really boils down to what I trust you to do in me. Become all in all of yourself inside of me. Fill me and displace my own self. My own desires and selfishness. Displace it so that you can have the preeminence. That's a real trust. Not many go there. Number seven. Number seven, the Lord said, you know, uh, this is what he said to me. This is the restoration of of my people through remembering. Now, if we remember, the word remember throughout scripture is a point is, is pointing to a covenant. So not remembering like you forgot, but the reflection of his covenant. And so he will restore us through the covenant. Through remembrance of his covenant. Right? This is that break time. With him. These are those times where we're with him and he is refreshing us. Times of refreshing in the spirit of the Lord, right? Meaning this, that when the Lord is able to stabilize us from our own way of doing things, there comes such a peace. Not that calamities have stopped, not that trials have stopped, but there's an inward peace that keeps us focused on him. Remember, uh, Isaiah, he said, God will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed, who remembers your covenant. And, and why does it work? Because he trusts you. See the bottom line is trust? He said, I'm not in peace because I keep thinking about him. I'm in peace and I keep thinking of him because I trust him. Make sense? Amen. Next one. Number eight, which is Psalm 127, which is God building his house. God fitly joining together all of those who are walking in covenant with him, bringing us together. That's another way he's dealing with our issues. We have to be around one another. You know, uh, John deals with this. 
if you do a research on the word uh, quantumia in the Greek, most of the time what you'll see is fellowship. But how is this fellowship as we would see it in the scriptures? It says with God and with his people. And when it says with his people, you'll see other references to quantumia of fellowship and giving, the giving of yourself and resources to make sure that each one of those will stay in the light. Do some study there. Right? I can't give you everything. You must go to the Lord, right? Now, number nine, Psalm 128, the fear of the Lord and true prosperity. That's when we start to see the measure of Christ increase in an explosive manner. And when I say explosive, 1% is explosive. I'm not saying that we jump from 10 to 50. But there's an explosive increase because of the fear of the Lord. Right? And we can see that in Malachi chapter 3. Remember? Um, and those who feared the Lord remained in fellowship one with another. They thought of the Lord often. And when they spoke to each other, I said uh, a book of remembrance was written about them. And the Lord said, when I make up my collection, when I put together my house, he said, they will be my segula, they will be my special treasures. And he says what he said of them. He said, I will spare them the judgment like a man who spares his own son that serves him. He said, then they will be able to return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who don't. Don't you see the maturity there? That they will be able to discern between good and evil because of the fear of the Lord. See how all this is connecting. So we're continuously ascending up and standing. And when he says stand in that holy place, Psalm 24, he says, who shall stand in the holy place? doesn't mean just be there, but who's given responsibility there? You're standing for the Lord to trust you. So, okay, I want to give Frank to rule over these cities and these nations. Why? Because he stands in my place. He knows my ways. He knows my words. He knows my heart. That's what he's bringing us to. To stand there with him. Okay? Next one. And that's, that's what true prosperity is. Right? John deals with this. Beloved, I pray that uh, um, you will prosper in all things and be in health even as your soul prospers. In other words, till your soul is dealt with, there is no true prosperity. There is no true growth. Until he can deal with the soul of man, there's no true change. Does that make sense? He does this even as your soul prospers. To, to the degree that your understanding and the knowledge of Jesus Christ increases, then there's true prosperity. Number 10. Or Psalm 1, what, 29? This is resilience. Continuing on in your persistence or your patience in the Lord to endure. And see, this is when the Lord purposely removes all of the warm and fuzzies so that you would endure even when you can't trace it. But his words are filling you. Number 11, Psalm 130, waiting on God and true intimacy. We talked about that one already. Waiting on God, true intimacy. Psalm 130. And again, Psalm 131, maturity and waiting. That's number 12. Waiting. So number 11, Psalm 130, is waiting on God itself. The intimacy there is being built. But number 12 is maturity in that way. It grows. Number 13, Psalm 132, remaining steadfast in the process. Because the soul will go kicking and screaming. 
but we must remain steadfast to the Lord in this. The Lord is steadfast in His faithfulness to us, and He is expecting us to remain steadfast in the, promise, uh, in the process. As we're going through this, as we're being changed, as we're being transformed, we don't faint, we don't give up, we keep going. Amen. We will see the increase of Christ in us. Number 14, Psalm 133. It says, The blessing of Christ in the unity of Christ and the true anointing that will follow. I know it's mouthful. Let me say it again. This is the Father's blessing upon those who are unified in Christ. This isn't just unity for the sake of unity. I want to caution us with that mindset. Well, we're all supposed to be unified, so let's just unify. No, no, no. We're unifying unto Christ. We have to come under the hand of the Lord in this. And so now the brother, you see how the higher we go, the more it becomes about Christ and the brethren together. So the father pronounces this blessing on his family that's unified in his son. Isn't that the purpose of the fivefold ministry anyway? To bring us all into the unity of the faith in context, the faith of the son of God. Not just faith, but the faith of the Son of God, the knowledge of Him. And that's that's the, the, the error of faith teaching today. We just want to believe something, not the person. We just, let's, let's just stand on the Word. Let's just believe God. You're going to get that car. You're going to get that house. You're going to get this. You're going to get that. Instead of faith in the person. Yeah. To accomplish his work. That's what true faith is. Trust in the person of Jesus Christ. Right? So then if you don't get what you want, it doesn't shape you. You know that God knows best. Isn't that wonderful? Don't you know better than your children? Let me hear you, parents. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so too. So that even when your children would rebel against what you're saying, you say, listen, I've already walked where you walk. I already know what's going to happen. Yeah. Heed my instruction, right? Yeah. It's what the Lord says to us. I know better than you do. But no, Lord, this, no, I know better than you do. Heed my instruction, right? And finally, number 15, praise and worship in the unity of Christ eternally. True oneness with the Lord. True bridalship. So I want to leave us by reading 1 John. I, I tried to, uh, to read. We also talked about this during the conference that um, the marker of maturity, if God would see it, in 1 John chapter 2, where he says, the babes know that they're forgiven by the Father. Mm -hmm. You know, listen, I'm, I'm forgiven, I'm cleansed, I'm washed in the blood of Jesus. And we all say amen to that. We're so excited about it. He said, that's for babes. Mm -hmm. Right? Then he said, the young men, when they get a little older, they're the ones who overcome the evil one. So the, the power of sin being broken in your life individually, is not full-grown maturity in Christ. Just, just overcoming evil, that's a good thing. We're growing, but that's not fullness. We don't just thank God because we don't, we're not falling into those same sins anymore. We were never supposed to fall into them in the first place. Isn't that right? Yeah. So overcoming, that's First John chapter 2, overcoming the evil one, that's the young man. 
But the fathers are those who are full grown age. They have known him who is from the beginning. Their whole focus is Christ. Their entire existence is based in Christ. Everything about them is concerning Christ Jesus. That's full maturity. So let's look at this in 1 John chapter 1. Verse 1. Let's look at this. It says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. Talking about Christ. It says, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. Come on in here, man. It says, And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus said, Abide in me, and my words abide in you, and my Father and I will come and make our abode with you. He said, So if you really have fellowship with Christ, you have fellowship with us. Because we're in Him. Right? Uh, and uh, when, you remember when Jesus says, uh, this is the cup, or uh, uh, the cup of the New Testament in my blood? Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul brings this right back up? And Jesus says, this is uh, uh, the fellowship, or the, the communion is the word that's used. Communion meaning, and that's the same word, quantity. If you partake of me, you're partakers of one another. So we cannot isolate ourselves from the body. And when I say body, I mean the true body, the true disciples. Not, I'm not telling you, oh, you just have to go put up with all the foolishness that's going on in the body of Christ. I'm talking about his true saints. Those who really have true fellowship with Jesus Christ. Verse 4 says, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. His Son cleanses us from all sin. So he compares standing in that holy place with the Lord and having him walking in the, the light of who he is. Remember, Christ is that golden candlestick that is life and light. If you stand in that place, you also stand with the brethren. He says, if you, if you hate them, those who truly walk with the Lord. And see, this is where I take issue with many, many of, of our friends and prophets who break fellowship because they have a disagreement. And they think they are justified in their breaking of fellowship, but they will have to give an account to the Lord for breaking the fellowship with God's true servants. That's why, here's, here's the point I've come to. When I have identified a true disciple, even if we have a sharp disagreement, mm -hmm. even if that was the case, I'm not going to disown you as a brother or say that we cannot be around each other or we cannot work together because of our disagreement. The Lord has these things happen on purpose to test our hearts. We've all had different experiences. And sometimes those experiences come in conflict with the other experience. The Lord does it on purpose, too. So, okay, now I'll test you in how you treat the brother. You want to go higher? Because even, even all, all the prophets, they all want to get closer to the Lord, too. So then conflict arises on purpose. The Lord stirs it up. He becomes the rock of offense. Starts pushing those buttons. Okay, now let's see how you're going to treat them now. Let's see if you will still embrace them after this. 
And that's why, in my own life, I've made this a rule that's been a rule for me for years. No matter what happens, I'm not going to break fellowship with you. If we don't talk, it's because you walked away. I made that a rule in my own heart, in my own life, because I want to be clear with the Lord. I want to stand guiltless before Him and not have retained the sins of my brothers and sisters. So no matter what it is, we can work it out. Remember Paul and Barnabas had such a sharp disagreement? You hear nothing else of Barnabas. That tells me something. Paul tried to work it out with him. He didn't want to hear it. So then the Lord was able to trust Paul with carrying the true testimony like no one else has ever done at his time. He was tested. And the Lord will do the same with all of us. And what was the disagreement over? Whether or not somebody else should come with us? <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't think he should come. I think he should come. <laughs> it wasn't even over doctrine. Tisk tisk. <laughs> say, man, don't all these men know the Lord? Yeah, they do. But do all of them walk in the light of his glory? Absolutely not. And it proves with how we treat the true brothers and sisters. That's how the Lord is judging how close we're going to be able to get to him. Our understanding of his words and his dealings with his family. Even when we disagree. You see how we keep coming back to that same thing. And so, even now, all of my brothers and sisters who have nothing to do with me, I always extend another olive branch. Mm -hmm. Hey, every once in a while, I'll think of them, I'll be praying for them, I'll reach out. Hey, I really want us to walk together again. And they keep refusing. What a test for us all. A test for me to see if I hold against them. Because you should be walking with me. <laughs> And a test for them, whether or not the Lord will trust himself to them. See, its depth comes from its simplicity. So, be ready. The tests will come. They will happen. But where we stand depends on the measure of Christ that's in us. Namely this, the mind of God in his word being uh, inscribed on our hearts. Mm -hmm. How much we take in and retain. You know, I started doing something that really helped me. I said, I'm just going to read. Because I don't get any of this. This happened to me years ago. I'm just going to keep reading, keep praying. Hopefully, Lord, you make sense of all of this. So then... The Lord began to trust me, put me in places. And sometimes I just might hear someone say something. And that, that'd be it. Yes, now it's connecting. Mm -hmm. And then this, this Rolodex. Y'all know what a Rolodex is? Mm -hmm. It's like uh, you keep all of your contacts on this thing. It rolls. And you can just flip through it. And We know we order. Yeah. Okay, y'all have one. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so this Rolodex goes off in my mind of all these scriptures. Oh, that's what you meant. Then I get excited. I go back and I start reading. And reading and reading, oh, that's what he meant. Then it starts making sense. Yeah. But because it was already, yeah, there was a roll of text. <laughs> you really put it up. <laughs> it literally, literally what happens to me, I, I, sometimes I hear um, ministers uh, speaking, like sometimes I could, I could say, Lord, like as far as our group is concerned, where, where do you want us to go from here? You know, like, let's, you know I'm, I'm praying. And then I can hear a message by one of my friends or something. And in that whole message, they say one line that sparked this Rolodex to start flipping. And I'm like, oh, I got you now. So now and then I can avail myself to studying it out um, in the light of Jesus Christ, right? So now he's being revealed to me, not just me seeing him in a vision, but me seeing him inwardly and him stamping himself 
in my forehead, in my heart. Yes? Yes. I want to be branded by the Lord forever. And that depends on the words that are actually stamped on my heart. The implanted word of God, which is able to save your soul. So let's pray. Lord, if nothing else, we know that we need you. And we need you to come in as judge and king. To get to our hearts, Lord. And see what's really there. And begin to challenge us in your word. Challenge us to learn and to understand. And Lord, I know many times I've come to a place of frustration while I'm reading, while I'm studying. And you have allowed such a frustration to see if I will persevere with you. To seek to understand, to grasp it, to retain it. I want to see you, Lord. I want to understand you. I want to retain you in my heart. I want you to be my life. I want you to be my all in all. Do that in us, Lord. Help us to see the Holy Spirit unveiling the person of Jesus Christ in the Scriptures. Let us see you so we can be changed. Let us hear you so we can be changed. Lord, etch in our hearts your word. And Lord, more and more, just like our Lord Jesus, how he was groomed by you because he studied your words. Your words dwelt in him richly in all wisdom, and he was trusted with your entire kingdom. He was trusted to be the one to redeem mankind. He was trusted, Lord, because your life was in him. Your words were in him. He understood what you were saying, what you wanted. Do that in us, Lord Jesus. Become all in all. Challenge us. Sharpen us. So that we would be vessels of honor and not of dishonor. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Again, I, I see the Lord standing here in our midst, knocking, knocking on our hearts. Will you open up and let me come in and have true fellowship with you? Will you allow me to teach you my words? Will you let the Eternal One live eternally in you? True life, true food, true drink, true covenant. Lord, we need you to do this. We need you to do this. We don't want to be left in ignorance. We don't want to be left in the darkness. But bring us into your life and your light. Bring us into the truth, the way, the life, Lord. It's who you are. I pray for all of those here who are part of the gym. And those who are here, Lord, who are not, but they are your true disciples. That you would get us beyond excitement and get us to understand. Get us beyond emotionalism, Lord, and bring us to the stability of who you are. You be our foundation. You be our dwelling place. As the scripture says of you, Lord, you are our dwelling place. You, it is in you, Lord, that we live, that we move, that we have our being. For you have created us, and you are building in us your house, 
a place for you to dwell forever, for you to tabernacle with us. And that requires, Lord, for us to be students of yours, eager to learn and to hear what you have to say, and to obey you in all things. Lord. Do that in each of our hearts. Let not one be lost, Lord, not one. Bring us all to fullness. In Jesus' name, amen.